Hi everyone, how's it going? JC here with another video and today I'm going to talk about something very specific because usually I talk about climate change or you know politics or atheism I should say. Not if I say religion people think I'm a theist so yeah I don't talk about religion I talk about more kind of anti-theism usually. Anyway today I'm going to talk about uh, teaching English in Asia because I think this is a topic that is on the minds of a lot of people. A lot of people want to do that, uh, especially like, you know, if you come out of, let's say, university, because usually you do need a degree. Like that's the one thing I will talk about it later, but they definitely require uh, some kind of degree uh, from, from a university in order to work as a teacher. Uh, so yeah, what I've done in the past is... I've worked in, in Korea, China, and Japan in that order, chronologically. And I will talk about my experiences in each country because the first thing we have to understand really is there are people who say, well, you know, I, I've been to, I, I've, I've been to like uh, 20 different countries or something. And I'm like, congratulations, uh, but have you actually, have you actually lived in any? And then the answer is no, I have not. And, and there's a huge difference between visiting a place for a week or, or less and actually living there and, you know, working there and going through all the hoops. So, yeah, that's the first very important thing to understand. Like, you, you could have a great time visiting a country. You could go to, I don't know, like Italy and have a fantastic week there like like I did before I went to Venice and also some other cities like Verona um, mostly it was to, like in the northern part but still it was nice but I have not lived in Italy though so I don't know how the work culture is you know how the bosses treat their employees etc etc and this is of course these type of things are very critical I would say to understand when you work in a foreign country again visiting is one thing living there and working there completely another thing you could you could enjoy visiting but you could absolutely hate living there though I do apologize my cat is like a hyperactive Duracell rabbit right now so he's just like running around like insane sorry about that i can't even cut out the noise or anything anyway so yeah uh, that's the first thing that you really have to sit down and understand you could have some ideas about the country but you have to then kind of think about everything else that comes with it you have to worry about the salary you have to worry about the utility bills you have to worry about you know how how the bosses treat employees in that country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just when you visit the country, you don't have to think about pretty much any of that. I mean, you might need like, you know, you may get hospitalized or something like that. That's true. But usually, let's be honest, nothing will happen to you. But once you live there for a long time, you have to worry about every single thing in life that you worry about back in your own home country. So that's the first thing I would recommend. Very, very important. Sit down and actually think about it very, very carefully. Now, yeah, I was saying before, this is an important thing because a lot of people who finish university, you know, they're unable to get a job in their field. Let's be honest there. That's just the reality of this world, unfortunately. Like there, there are, okay, let me put it this way. There are many jobs out there but these are typically jobs that people don't train for. So I don't know, like in Canada, it could be some kind of cutting down trees or something like working in the forest or um, construction work, a lot of construction work. But, you know, if you finish university, your expectation is not to be a construction worker carrying you know, heavy bags of cement on your on your back and, you know, uh, God forbid, f suffering a awful injury in your mid-20s and then that's going to ruin your life forever, right? 
um, it's the same with trees. Like, you you know, you don't want to carry... Like, okay, you get the picture. So, yeah, if you finish university, you have certain expectations about life. There are certain jobs that you just don't go for. That That's just the reality. Unless you're really desperate and you need money, then it's okay. Look, I'm not going to criticize. This is not the point of the video. Like, you're free to do what you want. But, so, yeah, in that kind of scenario, teaching, especially abroad, becomes a possibility. Because, you know, you, you're doing good, like, you know, you're spreading knowledge and education to people. That's, that's good. I mean, that's why we send our kids to school and college, university, whatever. Uh, it's basically so they can gain more knowledge, more skills, and they can do more in the world. Uh, so obviously, like things like education, though, this is direct help. This is like helping back into society right away, because you're basically sharing your knowledge, your teaching skills, etc, etc. So it's great. Healthcare is another one of those. You're directly and immediately impacting people's lives. Immediately. Whereas in your, if you work in the office somewhere, you know, you might impact someone's life, but who knows when uh, really, or if you're even going to do that, right? So yeah, that's the difference. Anyway, so yeah, uh, teaching, I would say, before I go into the country descriptions, I would say that the first thing about myself is that I I do not enjoy teaching. I mean, let's be honest there. There, obviously, like if it's adults and even with adults, I'm, I'm very, very picky because it depends on the adult. I mean, some adults are, you know, their level is is decent enough so they can have a, 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 a somewhat of a con conversation. Like it doesn't feel like you're talking to a wall and it's just kind of one way traffic. Uh, but yeah, there are, of course, adults uh, who who don't speak much English or any, any other language. I'm just talking about English because that's what I mostly did. I was an English teacher. So yeah, um, I'm very picky with adults, but I struggle the most with kids, actually. Uh, so again, I have to say, and this is, a, again, very important, in my experience... 95% of kids were all right, actually. Uh, but it's that 5% of brats, spoiled brats, and just, you know, assholes, uh, kind of young teenager who act like punks, etc., etc. They are enough to ruin the whole experience. They really are. It, it can be like hell on earth because... I remember there were some times where, obviously because the schedule is the same every week, like, you know, if you get that brat on, let's say, Thursdays, you're going to get him next Thursday as well, and then, and et cetera, et cetera. So I remember uh, sometimes after having these classes, I was really kind of, not in a panic, because that's that would be too strong, but I would have this kind of, I don't know, like this this very bad feeling that, oh my God, next, just in, in actually less than seven days now, I have to teach that asshole again. Uh, I have to have him in my class again. And that, and that really starts to play on your mind after a while. I mean, if, maybe if it's one student like that, maybe you can kind of, you know, swallow it and just move on. But like I said, it's not just one. It's usually like 5% of all the students you get. So if you get 100 students and 5% are bad, that means five are bad. And that can really ruin your experience, trust me. So I would say, yeah, um, in my case, I definitely did not enjoy um, the job per se. I did it mostly for money because I didn't really have anything else to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I could have done other things, I guess, but again, I, I didn't really want to do any kind of hard manual jobs or et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's another thing you have to sit down and really think about is, is that something that you would enjoy or is that something you just do for money or whatever, but you, you, you really have to, 
you really have to think about it before you go there. Okay, that that's that's the thing because once you're there, things get interesting. Let's just say. So now I can finally jump into the meat of the video and I can talk about my experience in each of the three countries I listed before. Chronologically speaking, first I went to Korea. That was back in 2007 to 2008. Uh, that was actually the first time and the only time where I actually worked a full year. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it later, obviously, but I did not last the full year later on for various reasons. But in Korea, I did the one year. I just stuck it out and, you know, uh, because it's important on resumes. Um, you know, they, the people, the employers, the potential employers in the future, they, they will look at it. And, you know, if you have just a few months here and there, they might think it doesn't look serious enough. So at least if you have like a whole, a full year, uh, uh, just at least do one full year, you know, uh, that already looks a bit better for the future. Anyway, let's start with South Korea. Of course, not North Korea. I don't know why, why some people like I remember, like even back in the days, I said, uh, yeah, I'm going to work in Korea. And there were a few. OK, it was a minority, obviously, but there were a few people who said, you're crazy, like to go to North Korea is I never said anything about North Korea. Like, why do you think I, I don't even know how, why people automatically assumed that, but whatever, look, wh whatever. Uh, yeah, of course it was South Korea. Uh, I worked first in Seoul for six months and then I, I uh, changed jobs and I worked in Gwangju for also six months. So first I'm going to talk about my experience in Seoul. The, the uh, important thing to under understand about the job is obviously the salary. So the salary when I worked there, so that was, uh, like I said, 2007, 2008. So, you know, the currencies have fluctuated since. So please do your research now to, to check how much it's worth. Uh, but at the time I was making 2000, uh, 2 million. So yeah, I was actually a millionaire in, uh, in South Korea, yay. So yeah, at the time I was making 2 million won, uh, that's their currency per month. Uh, so back then, if you uh, change the currency, it was roughly one, like I, I say one to one because it's easy to calculate. What I mean is two million won was equal to more or less $2,000. So you just remove some zeros, but you know, the idea is, is the same. So when you're spending money, it's easy to convert in your mind how much you're spending. Anyway, again, like I said, today you probably have to check how much it's worth. It's probably changed, obviously. The cool thing about working in South Korea, though, uh, and also in China, is that the company will not always. You have again, make sure with uh, check with your company because you know every company is different, right? Uh, but I think most companies will provide you with an accommodation. Uh, in the case of Seoul, unfortunately, yeah, I don't, I'm not a picture guy, okay? I'm not like an Instagram maniac or anything like that. So unfortunately, I don't have photos to show you of the apartments. Sorry about that. I know it would help. Uh, so you have to take my word for it. Uh, in Seoul, I lived in an apartment building. I don't remember which floor it was, but it was pretty high. Um, I, it was like over 10, I think, uh, because one, one time the elevator was broken and I had to uh, get down the stairs all the way and that took a while. Uh, I definitely remember that it was uh, past the 10th floor, but which one exactly, I don't remember. Anyway, uh, it was a nice apartment. You, you had a nice bathroom. You had a, a pretty big living room. Uh, you, you, a nice view because it was pretty high up. I could see like mountains in the distance. The, the view un, underneath was uh, so so. Well, look, it's a, it's Seoul. It's a huge city. Cities are typically not very nice to look at. So yeah, um, but you know the the mountains in the background. That was that was pretty cool. Uh, the other cool thing, obviously, is that the apartment 
is fully furnished. And that's important, that's super important actually, because it means you don't need to buy all that crap. Like you don't need to buy a fridge or a microwave or a washing machine. You don't need to do any of that because it's already there. And that saves, I mean, you can calculate it right now because I'm sure you, you buy these things back in your home, home, home country. And uh, you can calculate how many hundreds of bucks, if not more, uh, you'll just save just not buying all this shit. This is very important. And yeah, in my case, there was everything. There was a bed, a microwave, a washing machine, a stove. Um, yeah, anything you need, really. The, the only thing you have to be careful with is the internet connection. Um, so the way it works in Asia is, is that these type of, you know, uh, the internet providers, uh, they don't really trust foreigners. And the reason for that is because sometimes there are ca many cases where foreigners just pack up and leave and basically they, they don't pay that the final bill, basically. So they bail out on the bill and, and there's no way, okay, there's absolutely no way that some South Korean internet provider is going to, you know, chase somebody in the States for like 80 bucks. It's just not worth it, but it pisses them off and it, it makes them change the strategy of how they provide the services. So what they do is they will, uh, they will ask you for a credit card if you have that, uh, especially like in your, obviously in your country, because that way it, they are guaranteed to get paid, okay? Like even if you run away from the country for whatever reason, they're still gonna charge you. And that's a problem for people who don't have a credit card. So in my case, I think at the time I did not, like it, mine expired. I think I, I had one from the UK at the time and that expired. Um, I didn't have a new one. And obviously like within Korea, it's very, very difficult to get a credit card just right off the bat. So you, you have to think about that. Like this is not, you're not just going to go there and boom, you, you know, you got your internet plugged in and you're good to go. It's a bit more tricky. So just bear that in mind. All right. So that's basically about the apartment. I would say like definitely that was all fine. The one thing I would say about that particular company I worked with is that they, uh, I think, the, the, some, I don't remember exactly what happened, but something happened with the, um, the arrival date. So basically, okay, what happened, I think, was they told me to go there on a certain day. I think it was in August of 2007 or so. And so I, you know, I went ahead and booked my ticket. And then... Uh, I, I, that was just like a, a, a few days before I was about to leave, right? So basically I could not cancel anything already. I get this email from them and they tell me that, so I originally applied for a school that was mostly for kind of uh, teenagers, especially late teenagers and maybe some adults, but I'm not sure about that. But it was definitely kind of a more high school environment, which I'm better suited for, like I said earlier in the video. But I get this email just a, like a week or even a few days before I'm about to leave. And they tell me that they changed my contract. They're going to change my contract from that place to uh, a school in Seoul, which is fine because I was flying to Seoul anyway. At least that's, that's okay. But it's a school for kids and only for kids. And I was, I, I immediately there, I already had many red flags and alarm bells going off. But unfortunately, and this is the thing, I couldn't cancel because my, I was in Canada at the time. My visa was expiring in Canada. So I think that I literally had to leave in August anyway. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I had, I thought I had everything agreed with that company and everything was set, but you know, they changed it. So. All right. Anyway, that, that was the first red flag. And then the second red flag was when I got there, 
Uh, luckily, they were able to arrange an apartment for me, even though I, I got there, you know, early, according to them. Uh, so, so that was okay. Uh, but the other thing started when I got there. Again, they didn't tell me anything about that before I actually got there. <laughs> it, it's kind of important, and you'd think that they would tell me, but they didn't. <laughs> it was really spectacular. It's, it's a horrible, horrible management, let's be honest there, even though it, they, they are a pretty big company in Korea, which is pretty shocking. So in the, in the first week I'm there or so, uh, I get, a, I don't know, I get a phone call or something from my uh, kind of like a, a supervisor, let's say. And she was very nice with me, actually. She understood my whole problem. She was very apologetic. And uh, yeah, we, we, we had a pretty good, like, first initial time. And, you know, she was not my boss, by the way. She was a boss of a different branch. But that's the first person I met when I was there. Anyway, I get a phone call. She tells me, uh, hey, um, we actually need to put you into this training program. And uh, I'm like, fine, okay, because I don't have any teaching experience. I've never done it. I mean, I, I can imagine what it's like, but I've never actually done it. So, okay, fine, sure. So I get to the place and th there's a guy there, um, the instructor, and he says, okay, so now, you know, we're going to do like a few days of uh, kind of, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, orientation orientation slash training. That's what it was called. Uh, and then he says, okay, so after the end of that period, you're going to have to take a test. And if you fail the test, then sorry, but you're going to have to basically like, that's it. Like we're done here and you're, you're going to have to go back to your country. <laughs> that's what they tell me one week after I'm there, don't you think that's an important detail to mention before I get there? So of course that scared the shit out of me because now I'm truly in a panic. I mean, I'm in a foreign country. I'm far, far away from the US. I don't know anybody in Korea. Uh, I don't have a, obviously a, the visa I have is good for like one month or something like that. So. Maybe I can, you know, bum around somewhere for, for a month. But after that, I'm screwed, right? With all my luggage, etc. So that was, that was shocking, to be honest with you. That, that was really shocking. And I was, um, like, inside, I was really, really furious about it all, to be, to be absolutely clear. Of course, I didn't, I didn't show it because I don't want to get fired before I get hired. Uh, but I was absolutely like fuming with, with, with the treatment that the, the company provided. Anyway, luckily, I have to say the training was really like, you know, easy stuff. Like seriously, uh, a baby could probably understand most of the instructions. Um, the test itself was very, very easy. I think it's designed to not make people fail. So at least that's some kind of positive. But anyway, yeah, I passed the test. Uh, they brought me to the other branch. And then I met uh, my, my initial boss, who was a woman. I actually thought she was very nice and very open. Um, yeah, I didn't have any problem with her whatsoever. Uh, it was still a few days early before the job started. And so I spent a few days just at home and kind of, you know, exploring the area, walking around a little bit and whatnot. But the interesting thing happened after that. This is really, really a crazy story, though. If you, if you combine everything and you put it together, it's a fucking crazy story. Okay, so the first day I get to my job, it was actually a kind of promo day. So they were trying to, you know, basically go out in the streets and with, with leaflets and you, you hand them out to just people walking around. The idea is you advertise the school. I don't know why they didn't do it before and why I have to do it. I mean, again, that was not part of the job description, really. 
Uh, okay. Anyway. So that was that. But then the next time I went to my job, that was already, I think, the... I think it was still very early days. So we had very few students at the time because it was just a new branch. They were just starting out, et cetera, et cetera. I get there and my boss is gone, is just gone. And instead of her, she was replaced by the head teacher at the time who was another Korean woman. Uh, I'm not going to say her name, <clears throat> uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, and she, by the way, so I, like I said, I had pretty good, you know, relationship with the first boss. I think she was very nice and stuff, but I had an absolutely horrible relationship with that head teacher woman. Uh, obviously not on day one, but as time went on, definitely horrible. And I will, uh, I will explain why. So when, when we asked about what happened to the original boss, we were told, and of course, you know, this is just something they can tell because they have to say something. Uh, there's no way to actually verify this is true or whatever. Look, we don't know. But we were told that that woman said some not good things to the management, okay? But again, this is just what they said. We have no idea what was said, and we just have to take their word for it. I'm not a big fan of doing that, so I'm going to stay, and still to this day, I'm extremely skeptical about that explanation. Uh, and then, of course, or as time went on, I discovered that, yeah, um, that woman... She, she was a real bitch. Like, she did not like me whatsoever. And I think it's not just me. I think she had a problem with men in general. Like, she had something, like some kind of deep hatred against men for some reason. And of course, uh, me being the only male teacher there, there was another guy there who was... Um, kind of a liaison guy. Uh, I, I think he didn't get much love either. So it was not just me. It's it's men in general. Like she was a... I don't like to use these kind of words, but maybe she was a kind of feminazi. Like she thought, you know, women are, are superior and fuck the man kind of thing. Um, yeah, uh, that was a really torrid time, obviously. And uh, there's a few other things that happened when I worked there. The first interesting thing is that her son, who was like 12 or something like that, he was actually in one of my classes. So we had three teachers, but he was in one of my classes. And especially towards the end of my six-month stay there, uh, he, he really kind of enjoyed my style and stuff like that. So he would come in and he would, you know, give me hugs. Uh, he was one of the few, actually, who who did that and uh, I at the time I thought that's that's really strange because I don't see him do that with his mother <laughs> you would think that he would do that with his mother but he didn't and I'm really think I'm, I was really starting to say that she must be a, a really bad mother and probably a just a bad woman in general uh, I, I Probably like, you know, I obviously told him eventually that, you know, I'm leaving and he was, maybe he said something to his mother about that, but obviously he, he has no influence over her whatsoever. Uh, another curious thing that happened is that in my classroom, so the, the way that it works is that we had a, a projector in the room and each week we're, we were given uh, slides basically by, by the company and all we have to do is use the projector to project the slides on the, you know, on the screen. And uh, the students have to do certain stuff. Like they have to repeat sometimes or they have to, yeah, usually it's, it was a lot of re re repeating something. You listen and repeat. And also memorization, which 
I, I'm not a fan of memorization, so I, I didn't like that aspect at all. But in my classroom, that projector or whatever was not working for months and months and months. Like I, I did say to obviously everybody knew that it wasn't working, but for, for whatever reason, I don't know, the wiring or something like that, it just was not working for months and months and months. So it, what I did instead is just, you know, kind of classic uh, teaching. You use the board and a pen. So I would write certain things out and I would, you know, give them kind of synonyms and stuff like that. Basically, really be a teacher. Uh, if you use the projector, that thing is that thing is lame, okay? Like that that that's just kind of a that's just a gimmick that the company uses. That's not serious teaching though. Like pen in hand and to the board with a book, that's that's proper teaching. Anyway, so that that was cool and that definitely taught me a lot instead of relying on technology. But uh yeah, uh, at one point I, I was really like just tired of my treatment there and just uh, kind of fed up with the whole thing. So I told my boss that, hey, you know, I'm, this is not working out. So I'm gonna, I'm getting out of here at some point, sometime, just letting you know in advance. And that, that conversation happened maybe two months before I left since there was no follow-up since, I thought that maybe that conversation just didn't go anywhere. Maybe, you know, maybe they changed their mind. Maybe, maybe I changed my mind a little bit. At the time, I was getting a little bit better. So I thought maybe, maybe it can work out, you know. And then uh, two weeks before I left, eventually, my boss, uh, I think, uh, comes to my room. And she tells me, uh, hey, uh, so we have, uh, we found a replacement. It's some Canadian uh, young woman who's coming. And uh, yeah, uh, we expect you to leave in two weeks. Uh, I was like, my, my jaw dropped to the floor, literally. Because again, you are in a foreign country, you have all these things going you have your bills you have your you know it's not just it's not easy to just pack up and leave okay and and she gave she gave me uh, a two week two weeks heads up i think that's that uh, that's unacceptable i mean if it, at, at least give a month you know at least give a month two weeks man that's that's tough and of course I was really, again, I was really furious about it all, uh, but there's nothing I can do. So I, uh, on one hand, I, um, I started to look obviously for a ticket out of there. On the other hand, I found uh, some kind of job board there uh, where it was pretty active, I thought. So I posted my resume there and, you know, just kind of hoping for the best, maybe Maybe somebody else will pick me up and we'll go from there. Now, luckily in my case, somebody did pick me up and it was a, a, a guy from Gwangju, which is in the south of Korea. And uh, just one moment. Yep, yeah, that's fine. And uh, just completely out of the blue, I think I get a phone call one day I, when I, during the weekend, I believe, when I was at home. I get this phone call and this guy... Pretty much, it was a very interesting conversation because uh, there was a little bit of intro. Of course, he said, "Okay, I'm you know I'm this guy. I'm working for this company," and then he says, uh, "I you know I I saw your resume there. I need you." That's basically in the first thirty seconds of the conversation. That's what he said. I need you, and I'm like, "Wow, that's." That's really great because, you know, I was in a panic. I, I was about to book my ticket and get out of here. But, you know, if if you can arrange something, if we can start from in, in one week or something like that, then I'm available, you know, like, uh, let's go. Uh, at the time, he, at that, at that school, he didn't have 
another foreign teacher. All the teachers there were locals. So I, I can see why he was eager to, to have me there. And uh, I remember like uh, he, he drove actually all the way from, from Guangzhou to Seoul, which, you know, it, it takes many hours to get there. Uh, he was a bit late, but to be honest, there was a lot of traffic on the day. I think it was a, it was a weekend and um, there's a lot of traffic in Korea on weekends. So, yeah. But anyway, he got there. Uh, pick me up, pick up my luggage. And then we drove all the way down to Guangzhou, which again took forever because we got stuck in a traffic jam, etc., etc. But again, the same thing happened over, over in Guangzhou. Uh, I was provided with uh, an apartment, which was in that case just on the ground floor. You just kind of walk in there and bam, your apartment is, is there. It was, you had a bathroom you had a, a living room, which was just a little bit smaller than in Seoul, but it's still, you know, for one person, very acceptable. Uh, the kitchen was a bit small, but again, look, it's just, you, you just cook there and then you, you take the food to the living room, basically. It's one of those, right? So yeah, that was okay. And that was paid for as well, okay? The other cool thing about that place is that he already had the internet hooked up there. So I didn't have to go through all this bullshit of uh, having no credit card or, you know, having a really hard time getting internet. That was already all provided. Obviously, I had to pay for it, yes, but at least it was already there. And uh, yeah, the, the school itself was actually uh, much better for me because they had adults. Uh, they, and obviously, yeah, again, like I said, 5% of students, mostly kids, are real troublemakers okay so yeah again it's gonna give you a torrid time but overall you know i did my job unfortunately after six months i i was i was done with it i'm like yeah i can't i i especially in the final month which was august of 2008 i i was really starting to go kind of into depression mode i was really just done i i couldn't do it anymore and I, my boss knew that, you know, I, I was there for six months. So basically in September, I would leave anyway. But he, he tried to keep me. Uh, he tried to keep me for longer, but I was just completely done. And uh, yeah, I said, no. I mean, th thanks, of course, I appreciate it, but I'm, I can't take it anymore. Uh, the one thing I will say, and this is important again, if you do go through this experience, and I think this is important. I think it's better if you go, if you get a girlfriend there, or if you're a woman, you get a boyfriend, or if you're obviously same sex, if you get same sex partner, look, that's, that's wonderful. I think it helps a lot. I, people don't value that perhaps too much, but I think it's really, really important. To have someone there, you know, like to, to, to go back home and, you know, you're not just alone. Because if you're alone, like I was alone there, it really starts to play on your mind after a while. Like you, you just have so many things to do by yourself. Like maybe you don't want to clean some days. You don't want to cook some days, but you have no choice. Like you're alone. So, yeah. I, I really think this is important. I, I really can't stress that enough. Obviously, you don't want the wrong person. I get it. Uh, but, you know, if you can get somebody that you like, again, it's just a girlfriend. It's just a boyfriend. Like, there, it's not. we're not talking about marriage and living together for a long time. It can be just something kind of short term. But I think it really, really makes a big, big difference. So definitely consider doing that. All right, so I will finish this particular segment by uh, speaking how much money you'll actually save because, again, that's something people need to know. Like I said before, my salary, so in US dollars, was basically around $2,000. The rent is paid for by the company. So usually the rent there is between, I would say, 500 to maybe a thousand bucks a month. This is money that you never have to pay, okay? The company will pay for you. 
so that that means automatically that the salary right is technically a little bit higher i mean it could be you could say that well actually i'm making 2000 2500 or 3000 dollars a month okay the rent is taken sure but you know from that 2000 you obviously have to pay the utility bills your food transportation uh, some schools are very close to your apartment so maybe you can just walk there some schools not so you may have to take a taxi or something like that when i worked in seoul i took a taxi to go to work and back every day and uh to be honest with you i think the the taxi fare um one way was like three dollars or something like that obviously if i take the bus it's cheaper yes but it's all it also takes longer uh, yeah, look, I will not complain. If the taxi ride is $3, I'm taking the taxi, okay? There's no way I'm taking anything else. Uh, so that's cheap. The, the medicine in Korea is ridiculously cheap. I mean, uh, when I was there, I was sick a lot because I'll talk about it later, but uh, sick kids will come, okay? For some reason, even though this is not public school, this is just a kind of extra English private school, doesn't matter. For, for the fanatical Asian parents, uh, school cannot be missed at any cost. So they will send their sick kid to the school. And that means most likely you'll get sick as well. So I was sick a lot there. Uh, mostly it was tonsillitis. But yeah, I was really sick, like every two weeks almost, yeah, I was sick. Um, and uh, But I have to say, yeah, the Korean healthcare, you get the insurance from your company, of course. And it was really, 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 really cheap. I don't know how many times I can repeat really, just to make to stress that it was very cheap. I'll give you an example. So one day, okay, I'm sick. I go to this doctor who was in the same building, actually, just a few floors below. I go there, you know, I get the, the full checkout, I get a, a bit of treatment, and I get medicine as well. All of that, less than $10. I know that people right now in the U.S. are losing their shit because obviously this is kind of fantasy land, right? It's almost free. Um, seems like fantasy land for sure. But that's how it goes. That's how it goes, man. Uh, that's, that means that, you know, the, the government actually cares about people, even young people. Obviously, I was like in my kind of late 20s at the time. Doesn't matter. They will take care of you. So all of that is great. And that means at the end of the day, you save a lot of money. Typically, each month, I would easily save a thousand bucks, but it could also go up to fifteen hundred dollars on on uh, months where I didn't spend too much at all. So, yeah, um, you can make quite a bit of money. Obviously, look, it's still look if you're going for a job that's going to pay you if you expect some kind of ten thousand dollars per month. Look. This is not it, okay? This is never going to be at that level. But if you're just kind of, you know, starting out, and if for you, like a 2000 per month thing is acceptable, then uh, go for it. Why not? Uh, I, yeah, just let me grab some water, and then I'll continue. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, the final thing I will say about Korea, and again, this is important, so in my early in the video, I said it's a big difference just visiting a country and living there. Now, I know many people who visit Korea for like a week or a few days and they, they tell me that how great it is and how the, the food is great, etc., etc. Okay, you, again, you have not lived there. You don't know the people really. Just because a few people smiled at you at the hotel or whatever in the restaurant, that doesn't mean anything actually. I would say in general, I had a very mixed experience there, Espe like with the kids, right? I had especially one class where a, a lot of these kids 
they held very nationalistic ideas. They were always, you know, Korea, 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 like Korea number one. I, I wonder Korea number one in what exactly? That's the first question. And of course, the other, the other extreme is that, you know, they, they say things like, uh, I hate North Korea, I hate uh, China, I hate Japan. And you know, this is very sad when the new generation grows up with these ideas in the head. Like, if you're, talk if you're thinking about progress in the future, you can't have any progress if, if people are thinking in that way. You can't. It's just this, it's going to be a vicious cycle of hatred and it's just never going to be broken, right? So that aspect, yeah, I, I'm really not a big fan of. But I don't know, honestly, in, in terms of percentage, I don't know how many Koreans behave that way. I just don't know. Uh, but I do know that some do. And uh, obviously, it doesn't come from them. It comes from their parents. Uh, that's for sure. Kids are like a sponge. They absorb everything that comes from the parents because usually the parent is the direct authority. That's the person, you know, that this is the adult you see the most in your life growing up. And if they start to put these poisonous ideas into your head, like religion or nationalism, yeah, um, it's just going to be with you. It's going to be part of you, unfortunately. So that aspect didn't like. All right, let's move on to China. Just one moment. I kind of strayed a little bit here. Okay, so uh, China, I worked there, I think it was 2010 to 2011, if I'm not mistaken. I started uh, very late. I think I started in November 2010, and I finished in May or something of 2011. Yeah, so obviously, like I said, after Korea, the later places, I didn't last one year. So China, uh, for me, the application process was pretty straightforward. I don't remember which site I use now. It was a long time ago. But yeah, it's a job post. You you see something you like, you send them an email, and then if they like you and your CV, they will contact you. So that was the case. I got contacted by a school in, uh, where was it? In Hangzhou, Hangzhou, which is near Shanghai. Well, it's still like maybe five hours by, by road, but you know, it's relatively close to Shanghai. All right. So yeah, uh, the interview process was pretty straightforward. Just a few questions, nothing too complicated. Obviously, we talked about things like salary, et cetera, et cetera, apartment. Um, that was mostly questions coming from me, obviously. Everything sounded okay. So I went there and uh, yeah, the first challenge was, so yeah, I came there. They, uh, they met me at the airport, which was, uh, that's pretty cool. Let's be honest there. I mean, come on. In Seoul, uh, it didn't happen. Nobody met me at the airport, I believe. I was just told to go to a certain place when I got there. Uh, but yeah, that's cool. So I, I go there and I met with pretty young Chinese women. You know, some, some of them very good looking, I have to say. And and that's cool. They They took care of everything. I didn't actually ask for it, but they... They took my luggage, <laughs> they started to, to pull it around. Uh, and I'm like, okay, you need to actually do that. I mean, I have hands, I have arms, you know, I, I can do it, but you know, they, they took care of it. All right, great. Uh, then, uh, yeah, I actually, I, this, is, this was quite interesting. For some reason, I don't know why, uh, I went to Shanghai airport. Now, Hangzhou, has an airport, but for some reason, they didn't tell me that I could fly to Hangzhou. I don't know why. Hangzhou is an international airport. 
so I don't see the issue there. Uh, it, it made a bit more work for them because obviously they had to travel to Shanghai, they had to get me there, they had to drive me back to Hangzhou. Anyway, it's a bit more extra work. I don't know why they did that, but anyway. Uh, got there, the apartment. So the apartment was, you get uh, the, the first room, which had a kitchen in a corner, but it's mostly an empty room. I guess you could put uh, a table there and have eat there, but again, I'm kind of living alone, so it's kind of ghetto style. I just take it into my living room and eat there while watching something, usually on my computer or whatnot. And yeah, so that's the first room. Then you had the bathroom, uh, which was like, okay, uh, but the the uh, the bath itself was a bit leaky, I would say. Um, not from underneath, but from the, like, there is a door that you, you close the shower with. And I think there was a, a, a certain part of it, which unfortunately didn't close all the way. So yeah, every time after I take a, a shower, th there is a, a certain pool of water uh, outside of the shower, which was a bit annoying. But look, I mean, at the end of the day, look, that's what we say, it's China. Uh, there are things like that there. It's made in China, right? After that, you, you get the sliding door, you open that, you get your bedroom. Uh, the bedroom was mostly occupied by the bed, I have to say, which was a big bed, actually. I, I think it was like a... It was probably like a queen size or something. Again, I don't need that. I'm just by myself. But, you know, planning for the future? Sure, why not? Uh, and then after that, you get the kind of a balcony area, which is an in enclosed balcony area. And uh, that one had a washing machine there in the corner. So again, everything is furnished. Uh, they pay for that. You need to spend a dime on it. Uh, you obviously need to pay for your utilities and uh, food and uh, transportation. Not in that case, because I could just walk to my school. It took maybe... If I walk quickly, maybe 15 minutes. If I take my time, 20 minutes. But, you know, that's it's not much. It's good exercise as well. The school itself was a mixture of uh, kids and adults. Mostly kids, though. So, again, for me, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, the level, I would say, uh, in Korea, the level was a bit higher, definitely. Uh, in China, it was lower. Uh, but, yeah, the, the, the thing about China in, in, that, in that school, though, is that I was not really given a lot of teaching materials. They, they had some textbooks here and there, but there were some classes that basically didn't have any textbook whatsoever. What does that mean? That means that you have to do that work. Now, that's fine if you've done it before. You know where to go and what to do, etc. You maybe, you know how to put together textbooks. Etc. Okay, I didn't have that experience at all. So, what I did was, yeah, I started to go online and I started to look for Kind of, you know, games for kids, something that could be educational but fun at the same time. Something that would... I was looking for something that would kill some time, to be honest. Because, look, you... I know, even from my experience in high school, etc. If you get a, a 45-minute class, maybe you pay attention to like half of it at best. After that, you just wish... It, you just wish it's over, right? So it's the same here. Uh, you, you, you have a certain time where, you know, they pay attention to you and you can teach them a few things here and there. After that, everybody just wants to go home, including myself, to be honest. So then you give them activities. Um, I don't remember exactly which ones I give, gave them, but one I gave them was a uh, world scramble. So, you, you know, it's this kind of paper with a box Let's, lots of letters in there, and they have to find certain words in there. Now, the words are actually written at the bottom, but they have to find them in the box. And the, look, 
this is bullshit to be honest with you but again i was just trying to kill time because yeah just something to do and obviously the these words um you you can still use you can still teach those words at the end of the day like they're look especially young kids who don't know a lot of english they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to learn a lot every lesson it has to be step by step so yeah if you if you just give them like you know even if they just remember like three words or something that's eh, good enough you know can build on that next time but that was interesting though i i definitely like they didn't tell me about that before i got there uh, but yeah i had to make my own teaching material so i was on the printer a lot i was printing a lot of papers every every day actually um the other curious thing that happened there is so i get to china uh the 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 chinese gave me a visa basically a tourist uh visa i think it was also for one month to get the job though okay you need to uh get uh, a a work permit basically to get the work permit you need certain things like a like a health check etc now for some reason i was sent to hong kong because i was told that the health check has to be done outside of china for some reason i don't know i don't know why any of that makes any sense to be honest with you it's all bureaucracy as far as i'm concerned but yeah you have to go outside of china to get your health check so they sent me to hong kong and uh uh, they booked a hotel for me so again they paid for that but it was only for one day and i was told that you know i uh, i get there in the evening i spend the night at the hotel and then the next day i i basically uh go get my health check and i get my uh work permit from the chinese embassy in hong kong okay right away i knew that that's impossible in one day no way no way that can happen in one day in 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 maybe one week maybe uh but not in one day so that's exactly what happened there i go there i get to the to the thing uh to the embassy on the next day and they tell me that so the school gave me some documents, right? They gave me some proofs that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be working there, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they forgot one paper. Now, obviously, this is, it's kind of their fault because they should have done their research, right? It's not my fault for sure, for sure. But I can't blame them too much because maybe, maybe they didn't do that process before and maybe they didn't know, right? It's possible. So they forgot to give me one paper and the Chinese, you know, emb embassy staff tells me, okay, we can't really do anything without that paper. All right. But I don't have anywhere to stay that day anymore. My hotel was only booked for one day. So now I'm in a panic again. I'm in a foreign place. Okay. It's true that at least in Hong Kong, many people speak English. That's good. But still... I'm, a, I'm in a completely foreign place. I don't know anything about Hong Kong. So I started, I went back. I'm not sure exactly how I did it, but I looked around and I found this place. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but it's something like the Chong, Chongqing Mansions or something like that. Fancy name, but trust me, it is very far from being a mansion, okay? It's basically this big building with many tiny rooms and it's it's not a hotel, okay? It's it's basically like yeah, it's just an accommodation hall. It's probably like a one-star rating. So it's really really low. There is like cockroaches there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, definitely not a place you want to stay in for a long time. But again, I had no no choice. I had no, not a lot of money on me. So again, 
go there. Luckily, I was able to find a room. Uh, it had a toilet, a very tiny one, but it didn't have a shower. The shower was kind of a shared area. And do you really want to go there? Uh, not really, I guess. I decided to kind of tough it out for, for a few days and see how it goes. And then, yeah, I got my, uh, my health check. When I got my health check, I had to see a doctor. And so he comes in and he asks me, hey, like, you know, why, you know, what's up? I'm like, okay, I'm basically only here to get my, you know, work permit to work in China. And he's like, oh, okay. He asked me a few questions like, do you have tuberculosis? No. Do you have this? No. Do you have this? No. That was it. Just a few questions. Everything is fine. Here's your documentation. You can go to the embassy and get your paper um, without a problem. And I did. So that was all sorted. But again, look, this I'm just telling you the story because just bear that in mind. It's not just like you, you go to some place and you, you know, the week after you can start working there and everything becomes in order. It, it's not quite like that. Okay. It's, it, there's a bit more involved and just be careful of, of stories like mine. All right. So, um, in China, my salary at the time was I, I'm not exactly sure because it's been a while ago and I was not able to retrieve that information. I believe it was around 7,000 yuan, which is local currency there. Now, at the time, this translated to about $1,000 US, which is pretty good actually in China. Trust me, salaries in China are not that high. Of course, if you're like a, you know, huge businessman, sure. But if you're at the bottom and teachers are at the bottom, usually you're not going to make a lot of money, but hey, 7,000 in China is good money. It's good money. Unfortunately, you know, after you pay your bills and you buy your food and etc., maybe you need clothes as well. It, it becomes more kind of like a 500 per month. You're going to save and, uh, you know, that's still okay in China, but if your plan is eventually to go back to the States, for example, if you're saving just 500 a month, that's not a lot of money. And uh, yeah, so definitely salary, it depends where you go. Just be careful because there are certain like universities in China and they're, you know, hiring English teachers and they pay much, much less. It could be like 4,000 or 5,000 yuan per month. So yeah, you basically go, I think if you go to China, it's mostly to get experience and not so much to make money. I think that's the mentality you have to, 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 to go there with. Anyway, from that salary, you can save about half of it, more or less, probably more, a little bit more even. And uh, yeah, the apartment is paid for you. Overall, they will take care of you. I didn't have any problems with my coworkers. We didn't really kind of interact a lot, to be honest with you. Uh, but yeah, for what it's worth, it was okay. But again, I was, I, uh, another interesting thing is that in Korea, obviously, full-time work means, you know, 40 hours per week. You have to be at work. But in China, it's not like that. So when I worked there, and they told me actually when I was going there, they told me I was going to work full-time. So in my mind, immediately, I thought, oh, well, you know, that's going to be your standard 40 hours then again. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, I think when I started, it was more kind of like 18 hours per week, maybe, okay. At the, by the end, it was like 20 hours per week, but not 40. Okay. And, and that's a huge, huge difference. Trust me, trust me. It makes a 
huge difference. The other cool thing is, uh, compared to Korea and Japan, where you have to be at the workplace, like you have to physically be there, you know, because it shows your loyalty to the company and all that bullshit, etc. But not, not in China. Of course, it depends on the company, sure. But in my school, basically, I was told, you, as long as you do the job, we don't really care how you do that. So, for example, if you don't need prep time, some teachers need a lot of prep time. I personally, I don't need too much prep time. So, yeah, if you don't need prep time, you can just show up 10 minutes before class. You know, obviously, you don't want to show up when they start. Okay, anyway. Uh, yeah, you can just show up 10 minutes before class. You go to the class and you do the class and that's fine. After class, you don't need to stay in the office. You don't need to do any overtime after office paperwork or any other nonsense. You can just pack up and go. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't spend a minute extra in that place. I just went home or went shopping sometimes or whatever, but definitely I did not spend time at work, more than required. Just consider that, okay? Because again, yeah, you're making less money, sure, but you're also working less time. So, you know, if you're kind of more into social life and you want to be more interacting with people, maybe that job is great for you because you have a lot more extra time to do all of that. All right, and so finally, I move on to the last place, and that's Japan. Okay, let me finish my story by talking about my experience in Japan. So I worked in Korea, I worked in China, and I wanted to complete that kind of triangle, if you want, by working in Japan. Towards the end of my stay in China, which was in May 2012, I got the dates a bit wrong. I was in China from November 2011 to May, yeah, May 2012. So again, towards the end of my stay there, I had depression and etc. etc. This is usually how my teaching jobs always end up. That it's just look. Depression is hard to, to manage. If I could, you know, overcome it, I would. But unfortunately, once it starts to hit me, I need some kind of break or something. Like, but pro most likely, I need to change my job and just, just yeah, new environment. That's just how I am. So yeah, in May. Uh, I started, so again, I was, of course, all the time in China, I was looking for work in Japan because I really wanted to go to Japan. So I, I was looking for jobs and then eventually one, which was probably towards like, you know, the, the end of April, I would say, uh, they, you know, replied me and they said, oh, you know, we'd like to have a kind of quick interview with you, et cetera, et cetera. So I did that went more or less fine and uh yeah so but you know the only problem with them is they said okay we we don't need like a teacher right now but one of our teachers is leaving in summer and basically that's when you can come in all right so in may i tell my uh, chinese boss that, you know, I, I give, look, that's part of the contract. If you leave, you have to give them a full month of notice. That's exactly what I did. Now, their reaction was a little bit interesting because it seemed to me they, they kind of rejected it at first. But I, I, I said, you know, I, I pointed, you know, in my contract, it says... You know, for whatever reason, if I want to leave, I, I give them a one-month one month notice. And they can't really say no. I mean, that's, that's bizarre. I mean, why, why would they do that? 
anyway, the reason why they did it is because, yeah, I, again, I was at the time the only foreign teacher there, although there was another guy coming part time now, so that was okay. Uh, but yeah, essentially, I was the only full time teacher there. They really needed me and they didn't want to let me go. So I understand from that point of view. But from my point of view, my job is just to give, tell them one month in advance that, hey, you know, there are X, Y, and Z reasons I have to leave. That's all. That's all I'm required to do. Anyway, that was all sorted out. Of course, uh, everything was more or less okay. I think they, I, I don't think they appreciated it in the end. But look, I mean, it's my decision at the end of the day. So, yeah. So I worked in uh, May. I left at the end of May. I went back home to France. I spent the whole summer there, uh, three months, because that's that's what my visa allows me to, to stay three months maximum. Even though my parents own a house there, which is weird. I mean, you know, they... Okay, but anyway... I spent three months there. I enjoyed uh, the football during the summer and uh, got my work visa to Japan. Absolutely no problem at all. Within a week, I think. It was like, yeah, really easy, actually, I would say. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. Then it comes to August uh, and I come. Uh, so I come to Japan I come to Tokyo. They, uh, yeah, they didn't meet me at the airport. I had to go to uh, uh, Chigasaki, which is a, a relatively small, smaller urban area, let's say, suburb. And uh, yeah, of course, I, um, I got lost a few times, but some people were able to help me. Now, you have to understand that even though Japanese people study English, technically, mostly during high school. I don't think it's their fault, though. So don't get me wrong here. I'm not trying to insult anybody. But I, I will complain, though, about the educational system itself. I think uh, this, again, this is not the fault of the students, per se. I mean, sure, you got some who are lazy and don't want to do anything. And then it's their fault, of course. But most of the blame, at least for me, lies in crappy teachers, crappy education practices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, I will definitely very rarely blame Japanese people, but I will definitely blame the institution here for not doing their job. So yeah, uh, Japanese and English is kind of lucky. You have to be lucky who you find and how you ask. You have to use sign language, hand language, to explain things, etc., etc. But anyway, I was able to find my way to Chigasaki. I get there. My boss met me at the station. And uh, the first, uh, yeah, he took me to this house, which was, I, I was renting it. And it was a house, basically just two two floors, but I only got the, the ground floor. And uh, you, you had the entrance, which was a small kitchen, uh, a small bathroom, toilet, and then you had one room, which I used as the bedroom, and then one more room, which was kind of obviously spare. You can do whatever you want there. For me, it was literally just spare. Yeah, no, nothing in there whatsoever. The interesting thing, though, is that in Japan, it's very rare for companies to cover your rent. Okay, so this is one thing you have to consider. Like I said, in Korea, in China, most companies will pay your rent. And that saves you a lot of money. But not in Japan. Obviously, I think there are some companies that do that, but it's not common practice here. So my salary when I came here was, I believe, 210,000 yen per month, which again, to make it simple, let's say it's 2,000 bucks per month. Right, just just to make it easy, otherwise you get confused. Okay, and then so from from that money, right? Uh, Fifty thousand, so basically five hundred bucks, is spent on the rent. So 
That's what I was saying before. Like if you work in Korea and your rent is included, it's almost like saying, well, my salary is actually 2,500 or 3,000. Just I, I pay the rent from, from that, not from 2,000. But in Japan, your salary immediately becomes $1,500 per month. And that's not the same thing. Sorry, it's just not the same thing. On top of that, of course, you, you need to pay certain other fees, like uh, some kind of um, key money, or I don't even know what it's called. It's some kind of weird, it's not even a deposit because deposit, you get it back. This is some kind of weird Japanese practice, which I think is completely obsolete, but unfortunately still exists. And people give these kind of weird fees to people. I don't get it personally, but I had to do it. I had a really tough time here getting internet, like in Korea, because again, I don't have a credit card. And uh, in Japan, just right off the bat, getting a credit card is impossible. Nobody will give you one. So in my case, I basically had to kind of strike a deal with my boss that you know, they give me this one internet that I wanted. Uh, and I would obviously pay for it. But yeah, it, it went through my boss, though. That's that's the thing. I don't really like that. I prefer to take care of it by myself. So yeah, but but for um, wow, for at least two months, I didn't have internet at all. I was going to this internet cafe once a week. And, uh, you know, obviously that's not great because privacy, so-so. Um, yeah, there's still a lot of things you can't really do in an internet cafe. Let's be honest there. For two months, I think I didn't have internet. Eventually I did get it. But again, if you come here, just bear that in mind. It's not like you'll come here and you're immediately plugged in. Now you might be, you might be, and that's great. But you might not be. And just bear that in mind. Okay, so yeah, they don't pay the rent. Obviously, you have to pay your utilities. In Japan, utilities are relatively expensive, exp especially electricity is quite expensive, I would say. The healthcare, I don't know, because when I uh, worked, I didn't really have to use my insurance, um, like ever, or mm, often, let's say. When I did, it was usually for minor things, and that was pretty cheap. But I don't know if I had something more major, then I don't know what would happen. No idea. But yes, they did provide me with some kind of insurance, but I know it was very kind of specific. Like there were certain things that they just didn't cover. So who knows? Um, yeah. Uh, as far as the teaching goes, like I mentioned, uh, in Japan, the English level is not so high. So it, it depends. You have to be a bit lucky with your students. Now, it depends what students you get, obviously. My school was a mixture of kids and adults. Uh, the cool thing here was that some classes were private. So it's just one on one classes. That's I didn't have that before. Well, that's not really true. In China, I had one private class, but that was it, though. Here I had a bit more. But this is okay if it's an adult. It, trust me, it becomes very challenging if it's a kid. And some parents do prefer to have private classes for their kid. And again, with adult, it's okay because their level is a bit higher. So you can have some kind of conversation. But with a kid, usually you can't. And so, you know, if you have that, that time, oh, it just becomes like a nightmare. You just, you just want it to end so quickly and it just doesn't and doesn't and doesn't. The other thing I would say is that, yeah, so my company, they, uh, they uh, were a bit, a bit weird. They told me that the employees have to shave now, obviously, I hope, I hope at least for uh, women workers, it doesn't mean what I think it means. Um, but for men, obviously, it means 
you have to completely shave your beard and mustache. Now, if you look at my face, if I shave my beard and mustache, trust me, <laughs> I look like shit, okay? <laughs> like, it looks weird. I have this kind of weird sagging, a little bit of a sagging uh, skin here. Not pretty to look at. Not pretty to look at. Young, younger, maybe a little bit. I will give you that. But definitely not something I would I would like, you know. But it's it's part of the requirement. It's it's actually part of the contract. Like it's in there. It says like you have to shave. And this is ridiculous because do you really think like I mean look I know why I mean well, okay one partially is because they say it's dirty, you know, dirt gets in there and it's it's dirty, right? But Look, I mean, come on, seriously. This is this is just an excuse, I think. Now, do you really think that shaving mustache and beard makes me a better employee? Of course not. This is nonsense. So yeah, th this I don't like when companies overreach in this way. Look, you can you can have a dress code. I mean, that's that's as far as I can accept it. Like you can tell, okay, yeah, you can. You have to wear a suit and a tie. I don't like it. I don't like wearing a suit and a tie. I think, it, especially with kids, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Kids are looking more for kind of regular day connections. So if they see kind of, look, I'm not saying you need to go work in some kind of shirt where you have a, a skull with daggers you know sticking through the eyes no nobody's saying that but if you just wear kind of business casual stuff like a you know nice pair of jeans a nice t-shirt or a sweatshirt then what's the problem like why why do they have this stick up their ass here like seriously that that's one thing i didn't like here at all is the the dress the forced dress code and the forced thing about shaving. I'm not a fan of it. Because in, in Korea and China, I didn't have to do any of that shit. Just, just show up again, kind of business casual. And it's fine. So, yeah. Um, in the end, again, I ended up with a big depression. Probably the biggest, actually, I had in, in life. Um, I mean, up to that point anyway, and I had to, I had to quit actually. So that was a bit interesting because yeah, um, I, I went to the doctor and, uh, I basically said, I, I can't, I just can't do it anymore. Like, I, I think if I go to work one more day, I, I may do something to myself, let's just say, because I, I can't take it anymore. And uh, he said, oh, well, okay, in that case, it looks very serious, sounds very serious. So I'm going to give you this paper. Uh, you're you're going to be off for, for a month with it. And I was. And I can bet you that my workplace was not happy one bit about it. I tried to... It, I, I, after a few days, right, I tried to chat with one of my co-workers there who is also an American and uh, you know we, we met a couple of times here and there outside of work I mean overall not not bad but I wouldn't say like you know we were buddies buddies but you know still some, a bit of a, something was was there I tried to send him a chat just you know hey again I'm uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm sure this uh, puts you in a Kind of complicated situation you may have to work more hours maybe i but I, I can't i just can't do it anymore you know uh i never ever got a reply to that message not nothing like so i'm uh, i can assume that he was pretty pissed off as well about it uh, i guess everybody was pissed off really but you know i i don't care because this is my health we're talking about here and sorry but my health trumps all these type of things 
that's just the way it goes. Because if I die or something, then that's it for me. I'm not coming back, but they'll still be there. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, eventually after that month, um, I was still like pretty much completely out of it. So went back to the doctor, yeah, said like, you know, this, I'm, I'm done. I, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. There's no way I'm coming back there and stepping back into that classroom. Uh, he gave me another paper for another month. But I think by that point, after I provided that paper to the company, I think it was pretty much clear that it was, it was the end, you know, it was, I'm not coming back. And uh, yeah, again, the only strange thing I would say is that even though obviously I, I'm not, I think they did have my phone number. Yeah, they did. They did. Uh, but they definitely had my email address and I never ever heard from them when, while I was sick, you know, depression is still sickness mentally. Mental sickness is still sickness, okay? Look, I know you're pissed, okay, I get it. But shouldn't you, like, just, just check on the person? Like, isn't, like, for, just forget the, forget the work, etc. for a moment. Just from a human-to-human -human standpoint. It, shouldn't you do that? I mean, doesn't that, that, it tells me a lot about their character si since they didn't do any of that. It tells me that, yeah, they don't care about the employees. They're, they care about their business, but they don't give a shit about the employees. So, yeah, uh, look, in Japan, there's also something called alt, alt. I think it's alt, actually, alt teacher. Now, this is usually a teacher position that is paid a bit less uh, but you also work a bit less and essentially you're kind of a uh, more of an assistant than a teacher. I mean, sometimes, yeah, you take over some classes, mostly as a substitute though. Uh, but again, there are very strict requirements. Like you can't leave the workplace. Like you, you have to stay physically at work. Um, you have to, I, I read, look, I'm not sure if this is true. But I read that, for example, if you're an American coming here as an alt teacher and uh, if you, you know, end up teaching a class, apparently you, if, if the conversation ever comes about the Americans dropping nukes in Japan, you have to be like super apologetic and say it was like, yeah, it's a huge mistake. It's a look. I actually, look, I agree. I, I, I totally agree with that, actually. I, th this was an act of murder because, yeah, you didn't kill many military people. You murdered a bunch of civilians. Now, I know the argument, of course, at the time from American uh, leaders, especially Truman, who was a real fucking asshole anyway. And he said, you know, like, yeah, if we go there, then, you know, the Japanese will fight us to the last man, etc., etc. This historically does not match the reality because in reality, the Japanese economy was in, in complete collapse. There was famine in the country. The, the Soviet Union was rolling in and just completely devastating them in Manchuria. So they were, they were definitely on their last legs. So then the argument becomes, well, you know, they use the nuke to deter the Soviet Union from invading. Again, I personally really doubt that because I don't think the Soviet Union was in a position to launch an amphibious invasion of Japan. I just, I really, really doubt it. Anyway, beside the point, I read that you would be expected to to do that. 
Now, whether you want to do that or not is another question, but you'll have to do that if, if they require you to do that. So again, just bear it in mind, it's those small things. Now, there are other stories as well. Uh, I, I've heard some stories like uh, there are teachers like during vacation time and the, you know they get suddenly a phone call and maybe like on, a, on one day they're told, you need to come in. They don't really say why or anything. It's just, you need to come in. And I know some people who, because again, I don't know exactly the situation. Maybe the, the boss was like super drunk or something. Who knows? They come in the next day to the workplace or whatever, and it's just completely shut down. Like it's locked, can't get in, there's nobody there. So why are you there then? That's the question. And sometimes it's like that. They're just, it's just absolute bullshit. Like you'll have to do for no reason at all. No explanation. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say obviously like just living in Japan is quite challenging because the yen fluctuates a lot compared to the other currencies, I think. Um, you know, when I came here, it was one one currency which was like acceptable at the time, but now it, we have like crazy inflation here and it's completely unacceptable. So I think now the yen has lost its value. And then that means why should you come to Japan, right? But, you know, there are other reasons to come to Japan. The one thing I will say though, is that if you, uh, that's kind of true in other places as well though. If you want some kind of serious career, not in teaching, but in that country, you'll definitely have to learn the language. And for some it's easy, and for some it's really impossible. It's just the way we are. Look, we're not all capable people. Um, I, I speak three languages. I speak uh, English, French, and Russian. But I, I have big problems learning more for some reason. I, I really, like, just can't. Uh, certain words, certain sentences, yes. But not, like, full, full kind of language. I can't. I don't know. So some people can, and it's great if you can. Uh, but just, yeah, bear in mind, if you want to work here, uh, outside of teaching, I mean, maybe you want to work in IT or some kind of other company, then you're going to have to learn the language, okay? There's just no way around it because, yes, English here is more prevalent than 20 years ago. That's true. But it is still far, far, far away from being widespread, okay? So yeah, I would say compare, if you compare them all, right? Where, where would you go? I mean, where is it more advantageous to go? And this is a bit tricky because I think in Korea, you get a pretty good package. Like you get a decent salary, you get good healthcare, you know, transportation is cheap, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in China, the salary is, is okay within China, but if you go back to the States or Canada or whatever, then it's not that much. So I think, but in China though, the working hours are pretty good usually. You don't work 40 hours, you work like 20 or 25, 20 to 25 usually, something like that. So that means you have more free time. And you know, if you, let's say, if you're a writer like me, right, then it's great because you have more time to focus on your work. But obviously from, from, from a financial point of view, it's not fantastic. And obviously, of course, China has a lot of issues with sanitation and the, the food quality. Honestly, like I'm kind of very skeptical uh, because I know that I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how the, the health inspectors work really, how thoroughly they work. I can't really trust the process in China. Sorry, can't. 
And in Japan, the problem is that, yeah, you don't get, the rent is not paid. So that means that, you know, your, your salary is immediately less, obviously, right? And there's just a lot of challenges here. Japan is not as cheap as people think. It's, food is not so cheap. I mean, even when I was living alone, I was still spending like 80 to, yeah, 80 to 90 bucks a week on food. Utilities are not so cheap. Electricity is not cheap. Water, gas, eh, relatively cheap, but electricity not. And utilities, it depends what you get. So that's, that's kind of it. That's my summary. And of course, the final thing I want to say is that this is a, a theme. Uh, this, is, this is common across all the countries. Uh, crazy Asian parents will always send their kids, even if they're really sick, to school. Now, this is an important distinction to make here. When I'm talking about school, I'm not talking about public school because public school, yeah, you have to attend. I mean, of course, look, if you're sick, you should stay at home. That's my, that's always been my policy. I don't want to see sick, sick kids anywhere. Just stay home, get better, and then come back. Look, if you miss a day or two of school, you'll be fine. Trust me. Look, I've done it before in my high school days. You'll be just fine. No worries. When I'm talking about school, though, I'm talking about these kind of extra schools. So these are... Um, places that students go to after public school, usually. And it's optional, okay? So already, public school, they have to be there because there is the pressure, they have to take the exam, etc., etc., etc. But these schools, they don't have pressure. It's basically just kind of for... I wouldn't say, like, it's for fun because it still costs money. Um, but... There's no, like, test. There, there's nothing, really. So there's no pressure. But, yeah. So definitely, if you miss a day of that, this is definitely not important. But it doesn't matter because these insane parents, they will still send their sick kids to school. And, and that means danger for you because, obviously, you're in a small enclosed space and everybody coughs, etc. You're going to get sick, Okay. Just consider that from the uh, standpoint of your health, okay? That's all I will say. Of course, now I don't know how it is because now with COVID, I honestly can't imagine, like we had a, a very small classroom in Chigasaki and uh, you had a desk. I think it was like six, or maybe seven chairs or something. So it's maximum six students per Per classroom plus you so yeah seven chairs but very very tiny space and with COVID now honestly I don't know how they do it man I don't know and I, I don't really imagine anyway that's it for this video sorry it's long but I really wanted to give you the breakdown of my experience not just a few minutes here and there but more kind of an in-depth discussion of each place and the advantages and disadvantages honestly i think it's it's okay to go in teaching maybe fresh after university if you don't know what to do if you can't find work in your field maybe it's something to do just for a year and then come back to your country you know uh but honestly I would probably just kind of stay and fight for something in your own country and just try to grow there, you know? But again, that that's that's debatable, obviously. There are, again, pro, pros and cons to either approach. And that's up to you to decide. But if you have any questions, if you have any questions whatsoever about Korea, China, and Japan, I don't know, unfortunately, about the other places so much. I did look a little bit here and there, but overall, I don't know much. 
So, yeah, I don't know about Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia. You'll have to do your own research for that. But if you're if you want more information about Korea, China and Japan, then make sure to write it in the comment and I will do my best if I see it, of course, that's another issue. Uh, but if I do see it, I will definitely try my best to reply and provide you with the best information I have. It's kind of the point of this video. It's kind of to educate and inform the people of what they're getting into. All right, that's it for this video. Stay safe, take care, and JC signing off. Peace.